Right, well, here we are. Easter has come around again. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting at uh, university, uh, when you teach, you are very mindful of your students and how many turn up to your lectures. And uh, so if there's a big number of people not coming to your lecture, you take note because, well, usually, at least in the courses that I teach, I'm sure it's the same with CEPI, every lecture it has some very significant component because a semester is just a short time. So each lecture tends to have something very significant in it. So when you see a large section of your <laughs> community of students not there, you think, uh-oh, now what's going to happen? How are we going to uh, make up for this? So um, Friday, um, in the number of my classes, I saw quite a few students weren't there, and this is because they're commemorating uh, Good Friday. And so that's interesting. It's also interesting to see how people uh, welcome each other and talk about Good Friday. And um, uh, some, of the, some of the lecturers who perhaps are not Christians, they will uh, and sometimes make a comment. For those of you who are celebrating a Good Friday and Easter, have a good weekend. And so it's all cordial. <laughs> and uh, interesting how people talk and uh, even people who are non-believers. Okay, well, let's start with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time when we can meet together, Lord, and think about the cross and the fact that Jesus, the one who is the Word, the Word took on flesh and finally born to a virgin and then who went to the cross and was able to complete the task and do so without wavering. We thank Thee for the example of Christ and how we can look at our own lives, Lord, and see the challenge of living a sacrificial life. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, yes, yeah, so uh, there were a, a number of questions that came to me last Sunday about, uh, you know, perhaps what we could uh, talk about. And uh, really, I can't talk about all, all of these questions and answers. But I would point out that uh, Dr. Bullinger has really put together a lot of great answers in his uh, companion Bible. I went through some of the appendices just recently. And he was a tremendous scholar. Bullinger. I mean, he really was. He was someone who really put himself to the task and used the talents that he had in the furtherance of understanding the Bible. What is also interesting about Mr. Bullinger is the fact that he was able to say he was wrong <laughs> and was able to say that he was wrong right near the end of his life and could actually comment about the books that he had published and be able to say, well, that means all my books were wrong. And that's a tremendous and humbling thing to be able to say and shows you the strength of character of the man. And that comes up. You want to read about that. You should read some of the biographies around uh, concerning uh, Mr. Bollinger, but also... It comes up in Welsh's, Welsh's autobiography. If you read that, you'll, you'll find he mentions this. And this is really quite interesting. Okay, so the Passover. Now, uh, Pascha. The, the Greek word is Pascha. And uh, so this comes up uh, quite often in the Bible. And why would we want to talk about Passover? Because it's associated with two main things. One is how that the nation of Israel was brought out of bondage. Okay, that's the start of it. How uh, Israel was brought out of bondage from uh, the world, the, tip, the type of the world, which is Egypt, brought out of there under the blood of the Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb. And um, so this is uh, an interesting thing because if you read in Exodus 12, and you read here about how that a new year, this shall be the beginning of the year for you, that is for Israel, that this would take place. And it's under this context of the, the beginning of Israel's start under the Paschal Lamb. And isn't it, I mean, it's a great type and picture of the Christian's new life, right? 
We all have this beginning which comes from Christ and his sacrifice. Now, the other thing that's interesting for us who have come to understand the revelation of the mystery is that Paul still talks about Jesus, the Christ. He is still, for us, Jesus, the Christ. And I find that an amazing thing. I'm very interested in things that distinguish our calling, and I'm also interested in seeing the things that are in common with other callings. Those, that's, those are very interesting things to note. So he is Jesus, the Christ, for us too. He is Messiah, the Anointed One. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is the controversy. The controversy between Easter and Passover. Now, Easter and Passover are round about the same time, as far as the calendars go. They happen roughly at the same time. Not quite the same time. And the actual day of the Passover will merge sometimes and separate between the Passover and Easter. They merge and separate slightly. Now, uh, so what about that? Should we be observing the Jewish Passover instead of Easter? Now, this is a controversy that people will talk about. And one of the problems that people have, I think, is that they find it very hard to see a distinctive calling in the Bible uh, for them particularly. And for us, I think it's very plain. It's very clear that we have a distinctive calling separate from the nation of Israel and her adoptions and her calling. And notice I'm talking about her very specifically and deliberately, her the one that has the very special relationship with God the Father and who actually takes the metaphor of a husband to her. Very, very distinctive metaphors in the Bible. Now, um, so you find that there are feasts. Now, I, I mentioned this one here that comes up in 1 Corinthians 5, and we'll look at this. I think it's a very inter interesting uh, thing to see. Um, but before we do that, I just want to just jump forward a little bit. Um, so let's get a little bit of background to this by reading in Acts ch chapter 18. I want us to see the nature of Christianity uh, during the time of the book of Acts in the early years as it was formulated and as it was being practiced. So being a follower of Christ doesn't mean to say that there is some monolithic, uh, unified conduct throughout all time. Because a Christian would be simply a follower of Christ. And what does Christ want for us today? Well, that depends on what he has given in terms of revelation, right? So God can speak through the Lord Jesus Christ and finally through his apostles at certain times and given instructions to various peoples. And certainly after that, he can also talk again. And we are interested in the again part of that. So let's have a look at this passage here in Acts 18 and verse 1. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Here he is. He's walking around. Now, have you thought about how much walking this guy must have done? I mean, he must have been r relatively fit. I mean, I don't say that he was an athlete or anything like that. But, I mean, he, he would have been relatively healthy in body to be able to do all this. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, uh, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy. These are very interesting things for me now, especially since I've been digging into this whole idea of the movement of Paul. And I'm not so much interested in the book of Acts. But uh, I'm more interested in this post-Acts movement of Paul. Um, and so it goes on and says, And his wife Priscilla. Now look what it says. Because that Claudius. Ah, now we come to a historical figure of some import. Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. It's very interesting to see the course of history in relationship to the Jews and how people treat the Jews. You know. And it's a very interesting thing to see how that has happened through time in Europe, for example. 
we always think of the Nazis. But you know, a lot of stuff went on long before the Nazis in terms of how, how the Jews were treated. And I'm talking about how Christians treated the Jews. You know, it's, it's very interesting to see this. And even some of the big names, some of the founders, you know, Luther, for example. Just read some of the stuff that he talked about the Jews and you'll be, you'll be surprised, believe me. And it says in, in um, uh, verse 3, And because he was uh, of the same craft, he abode with them. Or oh, he was of the same craft. He had some skills, some secular skills in terms of craftsmanship. And uh, he says, for by their occupation, they were tent makers. Some more information about these people. Tent makers are very appropriate for a synonym of how we are supposed to live as Christians, right? No solid foundations, right? In terms of our abode, we are just sojourners in this world. And here he is, a tent maker. Some very interesting things here. Now, I've got another slide here that just points out some of these uh, emperors. Uh, Claudius here. Now notice where he appears because the next one after him is Nero. Okay, Nero. Now all these people come to a very ignoble end. It shows you the kind of thing that's going on in the emperor's household and all of the people that surround him. Uh, the people they marry, for example. Uh, for example, uh, Claudius is pretty well thought to have come to an end by being poisoned by his wife. <laughs> um, and Nero killing himself. You know, not too, you know, great an end for, for a person in a great position, you know, of influence. And these people could have a massive influence on people's lives. Okay, coming back here. Um, so let's keep reading Acts 18. And it says in verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, first thing, notice about what Paul is doing. Reasoning in the synagogue. That's a place of assembly for the Jews. That's where Paul went. And where are we? We're in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Long way in to the work of these Christians and this apostle of note, apostle Paul. And it says, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. But what are the Greeks doing in there? Well, here we have people that are associating with the Jews in the synagogue. And he goes on, and it says in verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Jesus was Messiah. Right? The Anointed One. And that's what he is saying to the Jews. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So what would he do? Well, in that locality, he first of all goes to the synagogue of the Jews. But there are Greeks there. There are Greeks who are friendly to the religion of the Jews. And they are there in the synagogue. And he addresses the Jews and the Greeks in that locality. And when the Jews blaspheme... He then leaves that locality and then goes to the larger place of the city and he talks to the Gentiles there. Okay. And it says in verse 7, and he, because I want to learn something about the Jews. I want to learn something about the Jews and what's going on with the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. <laughs> so right there. Right next to the synagogue, here we have this man and justice. And it says in, in verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue, he was a Christian. He believed. And what was he doing in the synagogue? Well, he was enacting Judaism. He was a Jew. He was a Jewish believer in the Messiah, who is Jesus of Nazareth. 
He was a believer. With all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Notice the baptism. The Jews were involved with it. The Christians, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, baptized. They're a part of this. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Supernaturally endowed, protected, he goes on. And he continued there a year and six months. That's a long time, man. And uh, teaching the word of God among them. Okay, um, that's kind of, there's so much that's of interest here. But what I want to point out is that if you look at this, you find that there were Gentile believers. And these Gentile believers would not be at all opposed to the Jews. They would not treat them as like, oh, dear me, these are people we need to separate ourselves from. Quite the reverse. Because they would understand very clearly that the Jew was first. And that God was dealing with the Jews. Now the fact that many of the Jews rejected the message of Christ and what Paul did in bringing it to them, just because many of them rejected, did not mean to say that they all did. We've got, we've got evidence right in the very context of Acts 18 that even the ruler of the synagogue became a believer. He's an influential person. Now if the ruler of the synagogue can become a believer in Christ, then there would be others, right? Just because... Some rejected it, didn't mean to say that there weren't believe, Jewish believers in Christ. And the Greeks in that area, uh, within the vicinity, going along to the synagogue, would note that. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 1, nine, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how we turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Yeah, they, would, they turned from idols, and when they came, to the synagogue, they were not there to somehow bring in false notions of other gods and the associated feasts. What do you think? They're going to bring in Ashtaroth and say, Oh, Mr. Jew, who is now a believer in Christ, look what we've got here for you to take on. All of these feasts to do with the gods of Ashtaroth and the Egyptians and the Romans and everybody else who's got there. Every man and his dog has got a new god, inc including Caesar. You know? I don't think so. That's not what's going to happen. Now, what I've done here is I've just gone through and just given you a little bit of a concordance of, of the word Claudius. I'm just pointing out that Claudius Lysias was just a local uh, person that was involved with working for the for the romans in that area is not claudius caesar but here we have in acts eleven twenty eight, 28 uh, and there stood up one of them named agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of claudius caesar and then the other one here found a certain jew named aquila and here claudius who commanded the jews to depart that's claudius caesar okay so there's claudius caesar who's involved with this uh you know mission to get rid of the jews out of rome and other facets to do with the Jews. And there's another Claudius. Now, if you look at the, the feasts, okay, the feasts are very clear, clearly represented in the Bible. They're there. And these feasts were given by God to the nation of Israel. One of them is the Passover. The Passover is there. Now, it happens that at the Passover, this is when the lambs would be killed and they, they would then, after that, be roasted and they would be eaten. Now, as part of the feast, this is the time when Christ died on the cross, right? Now, if you just look across here, I want you to see how important the Passover was to not only the Jews. I mean, I don't have to convince you about the Jews because here it is. It's part of their feast days, right? That's, this is what they're going to keep. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just look at this. First Corinthians in chapter 5, get a little bit of, of um, sort of background to this because this is uh, pretty 
up-to-date kind of sinning going on here. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, and which would be, you know, pretty bad stuff amongst the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. There's no mourning about this. You're puffed up about it. You're arrog arrogantly prided about this. That he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. The idea that you are just going to endorse this kind of conduct is totally unacceptable. And that you should separate yourself from this. For, for I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. All right? What did he say? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, getting, make sure, make sure you're under the spirit, you understand the spirit of what I say to you. This is my spirit. With the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Separate yourselves from him. Put him over to Satan. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Well, there you go. This is discipline for the sake that this person would be saved. It's not a matter of, uh, you know, just getting back at him. Your glory is not good. Know you not that the little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Now, leaven. Leaven comes up in the context of, of the original Passover. Because when they left Egypt, they left in haste. There was no time to bake up some bread. There's no time to... We just recently bought a um, bread maker. And we, I can't wait for Seppi to uh, put a few of her mixes. She's got some really nice mixes for bread. But they all involve leaven. So you put leaven in there and you get this bread and you know it's raises and co2 is made and then the thing cooks up and if you put the timer on you can make it work early in the morning and as you're sleeping and you're just about to wake up you there's the bread <laughs> i can get out of bed now <laughs> all right <laughs> i'm in trouble now <laughs> okay verse seven purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened for ev even Christ. Now look at this. Our Passover is sacrificed for us. So it's very clear that the Passover now is being interpreted as Christ. Right? It's now that old feast that was, was used back in the Old Testament to commemorate how Israel was redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now we find out who this sacrificial Lamb really is. It's Jesus. Okay. Look what he says. Now in this context of sin and stuff that's going on. Therefore let us keep the feast. Let's keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and with wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You keep this feast, man. You people who are with us, you've come to understand the Messiah of the nation of Israel. You make sure you keep it, but you keep this feast with sincerity and truth. And that is, you don't put up with all the sin that's within the congregation. You separate yourself from it. And he's using a lot of things in here about the nature of this feast. And he goes on talking about how not to company with fornicators, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, etc., etc. It's a great passage. It's very instructional. But one of the big things that you get from this is the fact that the feasts, that is the special, even the special feast of the Passover, was kept within its original sense it was just reinterpreted so the passover is the natural time to remember the lord jesus christ and his sacrificial work now 
coming on with this. Um, I want you to see something else, which I think is really cool. Look at Matthew 8. All right? We always remember, as people who understand the revelation of the mystery given to Paul, we understand that we have been given a very special place. And we're not a part of Israel. We're not a part of the hope that was given to Israel, nor a part of a heavenly hope which comes out of heaven and lands on the earth. That is the new Jerusalem. We're not, we're not a part of that hope. But we have been given a new sonship. Now look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Obviously, this is a centurion. This will be a Gentile, not a Jew. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Wow! This is kind of a little bit different to what you read in Matthew 10, for example, where he says, Go not in the way of the Gentile, or into any city of the Samaritan, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But here, the Lord Jesus, he's going to deal with this Gentile. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Ah, another good example of a Gentile who understands his place within the setting of Israel first. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. What belief, man? There is someone who believes. Say the word. You don't have to come to my house. Just say the word, and I believe it's going to be done. For I am a man under authority. That's right, centurion, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel, not amongst the chosen people, not amongst those that have been given the promises and the covenants and all these things. Here, this Gentile dog, he believes man and he's, he's demonstrating faith way above you Israelites. Look what happens here. Verse 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's, in, that's a Jewish hope. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Bang! Belief, man. This is cool, don't you think? But what it shows you is this. That first of all, while it's true that the nation of Israel given promises, it wasn't as if the Gentiles were simply an afterthought. No, they were not an afterthought. But there was a methodology that God was going to use to finally go to the Gentile. It would first of all have to be Israel. Israel needed to be addressed first because to them were given the promises, the covenants and the glory and all these things. Okay, that's interesting. And... I won't take you there, but you know the passage in John 4, 22. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And so that's another uh, picture of the fact that God was dealing with the Jew first. Now, Peter, what did he say in Acts chapter 10? When he was told to the, go to the Gentiles, the Lord used this great sheet of unclean animals, slay and eat. Not so, Lord! Why? Why? Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. Yeah, that's right. He was a practicing Jew, right? And what he was there to understand is that God was also going to work with the Gentile. Okay, cool. Because you can even see back here in Matthew 8 that that would happen. Now, I want you to see something else, though, that I want, which really backs up what I'm saying. Have a look at Acts chapter 21. This is a, a tremendous passage because it really, I think, nails it down about the Passover. All right, And not just the Passover, but I'm thinking mainly about the Passover. 
Now, look at this. This is uh, Acts chapter 21, and around about verse 21. So, um, let's go to verse 20. Acts 21 and verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. We have seen some examples already in Acts 18, where even the, the leader, one of the leaders in the synagogue, believed. But notice what it says here. It says, they believe, and they are all zealous of the law. They did not throw the law away. Now, what's going to happen here? Well, the, Jerusalem, the head of the Jerusalem council is coming to Paul, and he's going to tell him, okay, is that right? You are, you are now telling, you're telling all the Jews to forsake Moses? Is that what you're going to do? Is that what you're saying? Look what he says further down in verse 21. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Well, this is the word that's come. For some reason, they have been given this word. They have been, Paul's ministry has been falsely presented to them that Paul is saying, forsake Moses, you Jews. All of you Jews living amongst the, the Gentiles. Forsake Moses. Is that what his ministry was? Look what he says. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And the customs would involve the Passover, the feasts. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Then take and purify th thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. This nails it, friends, about what's going on in the book of Acts, and whether or not it is true that the that Paul observed the Passover and that whether he would say to the Jews, oh, forsake Moses and all these things. If he really forsook the Passover and forsook the law and Moses, then he would never be in compliance with this here. This would be a great sin on Paul. But what does Paul do? Verse 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. Aha! So there's no compulsion on the Gentiles to obey these things. All right? Cool. Save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the, accomplish the accomplishment of the days of purification until then an offering should be offered for every one of them. An offering for every one of them. He complied. He complied with this. What does that mean? It means that Paul, during the book of Acts, was a law-abiding Jewish Christian. Now, the word Christian, that's what others would call him. But from the common vernacular, that's what he was. He was a follower of Jesus the Messiah, which is what we commonly call a Christian. And he was a Jewish Christian. And he was here, right in Acts 21. Now, therefore, it is the Passover which represents and is reinterpreted and represents the meaning of the cross, that Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. So the Passover is the one that would represent this. Well, where did the Easter come from? Well, the Easter came about A.D. 325 at the Council of Nicaea which was presided by Constantine. And he was there, and he even took part in the council himself. And this is what was changed. And what was changed was, well, we are going to separate ourselves from these nasty Jews, and we are now going to institute Easter. And Easter is the thing that we're going to follow. Why? Because we want to separate ourselves from the Jews. That's what happened. So I think this is a very interesting, this is an interesting study and, a, and something that's uh, kind of um, uh, uh, important, I think, for Christians to realize 
the nature of the Passover. But here's something else for us. If you read in Colossians, Paul talking to people within our hope says, don't let anyone judge you in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are just shadows of things to come. So whether we get the exact right date or not, is not going to be something we're going to put people under and say, oh, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. No, we're not going to do that. But if you're going to ask, well, what feast day is or what day is it that represents the work of Christ on the cross? Well, it's got to be the Passover. It can't be anything else. And that's the scriptural injunction. And the business about Easter really comes in with, you know, Counts of Nicaea, 325 A.D., as far as we can reckon it. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time and for the uh, coming of Christ and all that it means to us, the Paschal Lamb, the sacrifice which is complete and finished. We thank Thee for salvation in Christ, and we pray that as we remember at this time of the year, this work, that we can look forward to the resurrection which is ours. We can think of all those that have gone before and know that in Christ we will meet again because Jesus, the Lord Jesus, was raised up from the dead and is the first fruits of them that sleep. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.